Ask, can you, do you still have the same problem? Not being able to move between the rooms? Ask, can you, can you hear me? Hello, I'm sorry. Problem. I... Do you have the same problem or, or is it solved now? No, I, I can join only room four. I, I've been there, but uh, they can work uh, alone. So I think okay. it's not a problem right now. I don't know yeah. because I, I, uh, starting this morning, I can choose which room. Yes, I can that's so can I ask you to update the Zoom? You have the Zoom application downloaded on your desktop, right? On your laptop? Yeah, yeah, right. From the top right, there is the option of the Zoom itself where you can, uh, the Zoom application, not the meeting, where you yeah. can check for updates from about. And click on your profile logo you'll have the check for updates option. Did you find that? I just find, uh, edit my profile. From profile logo, you mean, Ro? Yes, from the profile logo, the, uh, at the end, just below the help, you will find check for updates. What options do you have? Uh, edit my profile, upgrade to pro, and view advanced feeders. Um, okay. Then could you please leave the meeting and join again? Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Narmin? Yes. Yeah, okay. I, uh, I have a chance to update. So now it's updated to... Okay, I'll uh, make you a co-host first. Yeah. Then I'll assign you to one of the rooms and check yeah. if you can uh, switch. Okay. I'll send you to room three. So please try to move between three, two, one, four and let me know. Okay. Okay. 
مروفرا على دوم سري انا ادخل هنا كويت لا اللي هو بصير ايش مرحبا محمود الله آه. آه لا عندنا جروب ورك اذا انت شبكت وين شبكت محمود شفي في اي ام دي هو اي ام دي انت انت شو اسمك الحين اي ام دي برضه محمود بلعب ببين <تصفيق> طيب آه في عندنا بيطلع شيء اسمه اي ام دي تدوي تدوي الكاميرا محمود شوف اذا انت ولا مش انت نرمين سو ايت وركينج رايت ناو اي هاف ذا باور جريت جود ثانك يو فيري ماتش يو ويلكم طيب انت كتبي لنا Sarah, time's up. Shall I give them more time or just close the breakout rooms? I can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I remember the camera, but not the microphone. Uh, Escania, what do you think? I think we would prefer to stay with the program today and um, finish the exercise here. So extend or close? No, I mean, we should not extend, please, uh, because really we are uh, running out of time. Yeah, yeah, it's better. Yeah. Ask them to continue later on or uh, to work by themselves individually on these forms. Okay, then I'll bring them back. Bring them back, please. Okay. ما يمشي المجلد هذا علي جنيد مرات أنا بتصير فيه الحرف الأول هو السبب مرات إيش فيه قعدنا نادي جنيد جوفاني من أول ما أجا جنيد قعدنا نادي جوفاني يمكن بيجي أنا لفت I 
I think we're all back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. These exercises are obviously very quick at the moment, but so that you hear a presentation and you immediately try to apply this in practice. We promise there will be more time next week. Okay. So the speed is just so that we don't lose the new information. We start to put it into practice immediately. Um, I would also I would also hope that you see that there start to be connections between the exercises. So this, if you, uh, in your template today, started to list stakeholders and rights holders, but you didn't include them in exercise one, this is when they start to connect and you may need to perhaps go back to exercise one and see how uh, you might add some more institutions or groups or individuals. So each time, if you can just reflect on the work you've done in the past, when we have more time next week, you can bring that all together and make those connections. Okay. Uh, Sarah, yeah, yes. just a very, very short and quick question, uh, because the other presentations you gave us last week is talking about the participatory approach and how to involve the local community and other stakeholders. And today, when we just in this exercise, when we were listing who should be involved, and we were talking about how local community could be a dangerous uh, of danger, like an in involvement if they are not aware of the value of cultural heritage and their role is very important, but sometimes they are not prepared already really to know the value of the site and how much they are aware of the site and how we can this be avoided and how much part of the awareness or like uh, making like for them explanation of the project before they are involved or the preparing the local community to, to be part of this project. Is it an important process? Part of the process, I mean. Yes, and we <laughs> did. This was the problem we had on, uh, was it day one when we discussed this day two? This is unfortunately a subject that we could spend a week, two weeks uh, discussing, as we do sometimes with the ICRAM course on people, <laughs> nature, culture. Um, I don't think we should be naive about the community. Sometimes there are problems in a community, um, but neither should we uh, imagine that they don't always understand things. I think we need to remember this balance. Sometimes we think they don't understand the values and it's just they have different values. And part of our role is sometimes mediating between the values that we think are important as heritage people and the values they hold. So although we don't have time this minute for this discussion, I've noted that this is a common theme that lots of your questions are coming towards. And I think on another day, we'll have to find the time to have a proper discussion about it if it continues to be the key issue that we're all um, thinking about and it's emerging from your group work. So that was a very quick answer, but I think today, We've only got a Eugene today. We don't want to, to miss that. <laughs> so I think today we're going to stick to the program. We'll come back to this issue again because it's a really important one. Thank but, you. Um, yes, so Eugene, let me just pass over to you. Okay. I just want to add that uh, you, you should actually start continue to ask Sarah those questions because it's all about the steps of engagement and uh, uh, sort of making sure that you go through the process of uh, involving people. There are different distinct step steps that you do need to take. I mean, it's it's very hard to jump from no involvement to full involvement and them taking all the responsibility. There, there are always different ways of, of prepping and uh, going through the process to get to a final um, uh, a point, let's say. Um, but obviously this is not something that we can do immediately and, you know, like that with the, with the perhaps with the legislation or or by just inputting a lot of money into it and there just needs to be a lot of input in terms of time and patience and involving trust really um so i just wanted to flag that up before um diving into my original role um I'm just going to give a very quick presentation on the links between disaster risk management and impact assessment. Now you may think that, gosh, this is a, a little bit uh, 
really going out of my comfort zone when we're talking about disasters as well, when we were, you know, battling with the whole concept of impact assessment. But rest assured, I, I'm just flagging this up because this again links all back into the aspects of overarching management and why we need to be linking all the different environmental and social uh, factors into the whole equation of impact assessment process. And also to kind of assure you that comparatively to the disaster risk world, impact assessment is so much more fun and easy, let's say, because you do have the control of changing the plans and being prepared for different developments. Whereas in the world of disasters, yes, you can sort of predict and be prepared, but you can never change uh, what is going to actually hit you or uh, come upon you without you knowing. So this is just to very quickly go through some of these aspects. And uh, uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, before we go in with this passage from the operational guidelines to say that impact assessments, and I've just bolded the important parts it's to ensure the long-term safeguarding of OUV, but also it's to strengthen the heritage resilience to disasters and climate change. Now, what does this mean? It means that when you're actually, you know, trying to identify different factors and trying to find out mitigating measures, trying to find uh, 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 methods to uh, avoid or decrease or reduce the harm, you actually have to take into account that you need to be aware of disaster risk factors as well and also about how to reduce impacts of climate change. And this can only be done if you actually take in the entire environmental and social and economic factors that lie in the context of your site. I've quickly inserted in a few photographs just to get you thinking. Now this particular property which is a, a, a elephant sanctuary, an elephant preserve, looks very natural to you. But in fact, it's actually only possible because of the reservoir that you see behind, the body of water that you see behind the elephants were actually created by man about 1500 years ago in order to be able to service the agricultural needs of the community. So unless you actually understand the interaction between these different uses and the original purposes of these different developments. It's very, it's very hard to understand the different factors coming into play. I talked about the fortress, the mountain fortress, as an example. The fortress itself, the stone walls itself, yes, they are important cultural heritage, but they're absolutely useless if they are not situated on top of those that particular mountain taking into account the different ridges and the valleys and the height differences of the particular places. So it's no use of us just thinking about the heritage itself in its own um, individuality, but you have to really think about the interdependencies that it relies upon. And because it sits in, on top of the mountain, it actually exposes itself to different factors and different risks. Now, the reason that we're actually trying to think about factors is because all these different threats that I think you must have all gone through during the periodic reporting process of the World Heritage Center, of the World Heritage Convention, these factors are all factors that could uh, affect, that, that could impact the property in negative ways, but also in positive ways. But there are also factors that could lead on to different disasters happening at the site. And what we're doing in terms of management is yes, we need to take the heritage place. We, we need to be able to make sure it's healthy, it's well-maintained and managed. And while it's also contributing to society, but that needs to happen once you have the people values context and understanding of the heritage place so that you can actually be proactively prepared for disasters but then you can actually be proactively prepared for any kind of development. Any, these are the two different kind of changes, the big changes that could happen to heritage. And if you want to do good management, you need to be thinking ahead and sort of predicting, okay, what kind of changes could happen to my site and what do I have to be prepared for? Now I'm just showing you the slide on disaster risk analysis because to show you the correlation 
that it has to impact assessment procedures. I just want you to focus on the blue boxes at the top. If you read it, it's identifying heritage attributes and values, is to list the natural and human induced hazards, and the, in this case, it would be the factors. It would be identifying the physical, social, economic vulnerabilities within the property. So this is also, again, understanding the context of where the heritage sits and the kind of relationships that it has. And then analyze the cause and effect relationships. This is the entire uh, impact assessment procedure, you know, if you're evaluating what kind of impacts it's going to have. And then analyze potential impact on identified heritage values. And you can see that all the way throughout the whole methodology of thought, the thought process that is adopted within the disaster risk planning world and the impact assessment world is very, very similar. So in fact, you can actually do an impact assessment process, do it really well, and be able to actually also address disaster risk management uh, needs of your particular site. Now, the one difference with DRM and impact assessment is that uh, whereas in impact assessment, we have the ability to be changing the project itself, changing the change, let's say, we can mediate the change that comes. In DRM, that's impossible to do. You can't possibly change you know, the magnitude of an earthquake happening, or you can't possibly change uh, the torrential rainfall but you can be prepared to be reacting to that change. So the, um, the essence, essential action that you can take on the heritage site is a little bit different in that perspective, but all the same, the thought process that takes you through in terms of getting yourself prepared for proactive management is very, very similar. Now, by now you've been accustomed, I think, to this rainbow list of the steps depicting the different processes of impact assessment. And I just wanted to add in a few more things to, to these particular steps that you can think about and make sure that you're also addressing DRM needs as well. So when you're talking about participation, when you talk about all the different institutions and departments and agencies that you need to involve, you also need to involve environmental organizations to be able to identify different climate change issues. You also need to involve DRM, disaster risk management organizations, and this could in include the fire brigade. This could include um, the, the safety, uh, safety authorities that are in the municipal government that needs to take care of the residential safety measures, so on and so forth. Um, it's also very, very probable that on a national level or at a regional level, there will be hazard and risk maps already, already accumulated, already compiled within the governmental system. So it's very important that when you're doing your scoping and your baseline assessments of the site itself and the project proposal, you need to check the existing hazard and risk maps and also include the factors of climate change induced hazards so that Right now, it may not be a factor, but rising sea level could become a hazard that could be bringing upon different disasters happening at a certain stage. You also need to think about when you're talking about the proposed development at the step of identifying the proposal and trying to analyze it. You also need to think about the long-term vulnerability now, disaster risk management people talk about vulnerability because it increases the risk of disasters happening at a greater magnitude. If you are vulnerable, of course, you're going to be hit harder, uh, much more so than when you are actually prepared. You need to think about the aftermath consequences of sourcing different materials, if it could actually mean that right now it's fine, but if there's heavy rain, because you've actually extracted all the soil out of a, of a nearby uh, uh, mountain or a, a nearby mound, hill, it could actually mean that landslides are being precipitated. You're, you're actually anticipating a lot of landslides happening in the next rainfall. So these are the things that you need to think about. I'll give you an example of, uh, of a case that was actually 
um, raised by IUCN. This is a site in Sri Lanka or uh, along the north coast of Sri Lanka where there was a safari uh, hotel. There was a hotel that was hit by the 2004 tsunami, um, the West Indies uh, Indian Ocean tsunami, where the tsunami brought in a wave height of about seven meters and approximately 27 people were dead um, as a result of the tsunami. Now this hotel in particular suffered severely from the tsunami because in order to have a sea view, an ocean view of, of the hotel rooms, they had cleared out all the natural coastal vegetation and they had cleared down all the sand dunes in front of the hotel. Now, the hotel suffered a damage of approximately 1.4 US million dollars and it was closed for two years to do the restoration works. The staff was cut by 60% and the estimated loss to the local economy because the local community couldn't sell their products or, or provide services to the hotel was about 800,000 US dollars per year. Now, in comparison, there was another hotel that was established a few kilometers up north along the same coastline and was um, impacted by the same tsunami in 2004. Now this photograph was taken two years after the tsunami and you can see the hotel in that little circle to the right where there's the green roof almost indistinguishable and the resort actually hadn't cleared any of the sand dunes in front and they hadn't cleared the natural vegetation instead they chose the the proposal to actually integrate the hotel into the vegetation. And as a result, the tsunami wave height in this particular area was only measured at five centimeters compared to the seven meter wave of the other, other hotel that was devastatedly hit. Now it's actually been attributed to the existence of the vegetation and the sand dunes that this hotel actually suffered no damage at all. So this shows that how you design your development pr uh, proposal could also impact on having uh, increasing risks to upcoming disasters. This is another um, example from Bangkok where the historic city of Ayutthaya was completely flooded over in the, in the floods that happened in 2011. And one of the reasons that was behind this, uh, this devastating flood was precisely because the city of Bangkok and the neighboring areas of the Ayutthaya city was heavily developed in the past years. And the development proposals, although it didn't impact immediately on the historic site itself, nor to the entire city fabric at that particular moment, it increased the vulnerability of having floods happening over and over again, that in the end, it was this whole city ground was sinking because of the uh, impact of heavy development. So you need to be taking into account these trends of development and uh, increase in vulnerability to disasters. So that when you're actually talking about avoidance or minimizing or enhancing different mitigation measures, those factors also need to come into play. You need to be able to use these factors to say no or yes to a certain kind of development. And this has to be iteratively checked against this implication against disaster risk. So um, just to make sure that when you are proposing different or you are reviewing different mitigation and enhancement measures, you'll be able to have, be conscious of the fact that, okay, does this proposal actually increase my risk to disasters? And you need to make sure that this project is not creating any new risks to disasters. So just to be sure that when you are going through a review process or a decision-making process, make sure that you involve the disaster risk management authorities or experts into your panel and that these regulations and follow-up measures can include aspects addressing these needs as well. Now, I'm just gonna close with the fact that these are all the different manuals and guidances that talk about integrated management, about disaster risk, about uh, impact assessment. Up till now, these were all very separate and independent resources. What we're doing right now within the World Heritage Leadership Program is to make sure that these can be all connected together 
so that you have the same kind of baseline understanding of the management system that you can apply to different realms of disaster risk and climate change adaptation or impact assessment. So I leave it at that. I hope I was quick enough to abide by the timing and I give the floor back to Sarah. I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you, Eugene. Yes, it's questions time. Well, you all need a coffee break before you, <laughs> before your brains <laughs> create new questions. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, well, I don't see anyone raising his hand. Or her I just hand. a very quick question, really. So here we're talking only about the natural catastrophes, right? not like in conflict zones or man-made um, effects, right? Uh, when we're talking about disasters, uh, it's not just natural catastrophes. It can be human-induced risk hazards as well. Um, there is this whole uh, increasing level of different disasters happening um, because of human-induced factors that may appear to be natural, but not necessarily natural at all in its cause and origins. Um, but it, when we are actually talking about conflicts, um, it's not necessarily within the whole, uh, it's considered as a factor, but it's not the actual disaster that we're trying to deal against. Thank you. No more questions? I guess everybody wants coffee. A break for 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you.
يعطيكم العافيه المجموعات شغاله ولا كيف انا مش ظاهر عندي اي صوت محمود احنا حاليا مش مجموعه احنا في بريك بعد تقريبا اربع دقائق بنرجع على الـ على البرزنتيشنز اوكي تمام شكرا شكرا على بي.
حبيبي Thank you. Um, welcome back. We have got just under an hour left today. So the next uh, thing that you'll see on the programme is that we want to talk about factors. Now, this is something we can do quite quickly because it ties in very much to what Eugene was talking about. Now, when we're talking about factors, um, I can even share a PowerPoint quite quickly. We are using today the list of factors that you will find when you're doing the periodic reporting for World Heritage. So some of you will be very familiar with this because um, it was the Arab region last last year, I believe, for periodic reporting. For those of you who haven't been involved in this sort of um, work, these are simply a list of factors that might affect your heritage. And it ties into Eugene because a lot of these can be related to disaster risk. But in actual fact, the last question that we had uh, is disaster risk only related to natural um, problems. Obviously, there are a lot of other issues that can arise which aren't technically disaster risk but which still might cause big problems for our heritage so that goes from anything from conflict which is a really obvious one through to things like tourism which we often refer to as positive but can provide enormous um, difficulties for our heritage so my presentation now is not really a presentation in so much as um, a a request for you to think about these factors because we're going to have another very quick group work. In this place, both the presentation and the exercise are very quick. I would just like to go through this list with you. And the group work is simply going to ask you to consider which of these issues are most important in Bethlehem at the World Heritage Property. So we don't have to spend a long time analysing them. I think you'll probably immediately start to think which of these issues are relevant to the case study that we're working on. But I just before we run through the list, I wanted to add one thing to what Eugene was talking about earlier. This idea that disaster risk can connect to impact assessments because it's something that is not always being done very well. So I want to give you two examples before we move on. In the case of uh, Villa Adriana, Scania showed you um, that the development project was in the buffer zone of the World Heritage property. I'm not sure if we explained that it was also in an area that had been identified as at risk of flooding. So it was another issue that, strangely enough, the, um, the permissions have been granted for the development. And I believe that the flood risk mapping had been done after that permission because it was something that had never been considered, but it added an extra element uh, to the discussion of whether this was the appropriate location for a development or not. Not only was it in World Heritage, but if they proceeded with the development, the, the people living in this area would have been at huge risk of floods. It's something that happens regularly. Um, so it was, an, it was another uh, issue that we had to look at in the impact assessment. And on the other hand, I give you the example of Gaul in Sri Lanka, which we looked at together on the first day. Uh, one of the parts of the development project there were sea walls, which were going to be protective because as uh, Eugene mentioned, Sri Lanka has been hit by tsunamis in the past and it's something they're very aware of for the future. So part of the uh, infrastructure they were putting in would have protected that entire bay from potential future events like tsunamis. So again, that was um, an example, but a more positive example, where the disaster risk mentality helped us to also look if there was a real need for this project. And there was some real benefits there 
that would have protected the World Heritage property. So these are just two examples of where disaster risk, again, in, uh, it's not just theoretical. These are very much considerations that make a big difference in impact assessment. But uh, returning to our list of factors, I'm just going to run through this list very quickly. As I speak, please consider um, the case study we're looking at, so the birthplace of Jesus, which of these are most relevant for your group work. But of course, not all of you work at, the, at that single property. So these are also things for you to consider in the places you're working now and possibly in the future. Um, when we're thinking about factors, it is just always remembering. You might have a factor that is not even relevant. <laughs> You know, the, the issue is so small, we don't have to worry too much about it. We're thinking very much in terms of which factors are relevant. And then we we'll want to understand, in some cases, they're positive factors. Tourism is one that divides us all, whether it's positive or negative. Uh, we want to understand if these factors are something that is happening now, so current, or it's a potential problem for the future. And then we go to understand if it's a factor that is, um, is occurring within the property itself, if it's uh, generated within the property or comes from without, if it's a pressure uh, that was being experienced outside the actual core of the world heritage. And it's useful to understand trends. Obviously, if we're looking at impact assessment, if there's a factor that is increasing over time, it might be much more alarming to us and we might be adding to it with a new development than if it's a stable or decreasing situation. So it's well worth understanding which are the biggest problems that we're facing and then looking at them in all these different areas. Um, and the reason we're doing this is because impact assessment is the moment where we're really understanding a particular project. It's a major factor, but there are many different factors that affect our management on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is the state's party's responsibility to think about these and protect the property in whatever form. It needs a discussion. Um, oh, I, I simply added this because it was something that we did include for Gaul, as I've just mentioned. We actually used the periodic reporting to understand the situation better. So the factors themselves, the first one, and um, if you remember on the first day, we, we said which were the biggest problems facing properties around the world. Buildings and development is something that is continues to be uh, a point of discussion, whether they're appropriate or not appropriate. And that includes if they're in the buffer zone, not just in the core zone. Um, and we're thinking about them and it's sometimes visual impact, but I would also suggest that equally important is if they're appropriate within the urban form of the place that they're being built. We also have uh, infrastructure. Now, transport issues are a huge uh, problem across the world in all different types. Uh, even in the case that you see on the slide, the original road project was replaced by a tunnel project so that it was less visible in the landscape, but even the tunnel itself is causing massive concerns. We have uh, factors relating to energy, uh, renewable energy, um, all different sorts of infrastructure across the landscape, some of them with very positive implications like renewable energy in theory is a good thing, but it can impact potentially on world heritage. In some cases, the infrastructure is, is more clearly uh, negative that the discussion needs to be had when and where. And dams are even bigger, that have potential for even bigger impacts than uh, something like a wind farm, can dramatically change a landscape. We have pollution, which is something which we're finding not just in natural environments, but also in a lot of urban environments. Biological resource use and modification. Now, this is something that for a long time, I think cultural properties were ignoring as something that was only affecting the nature sector. But we have a huge category of cultural landscapes and a lot of these issues are really important to understand the human interaction with the environment 
and when things are working well and they're supporting the values of the property and when the changes uh, are negative. And resource extraction is a big issue. Again, it's not easy to say when they're negative and when they're positive. Within the nature sector, there have been some very clear messages from the World Heritage Committee that, for example, mining is never appropriate in a natural world heritage property. But interestingly, we have some cultural properties on the site, uh, sorry, on the list, which are listed as being mining landscapes. And this should remind us that when we're talking about whether something is negative or positive, it is always related to the values and to the OUV of that place. We can't unfortunately give you easy rules. Everything needs to be an analysis of the specific situation. And there are local conditions that will affect the physical fabric, uh, the conservation conditions of a property. And how society uses heritage. I think we can all think of very clear examples. Uh, the changing roles of some of our built heritage in particular. Tourism is a massive challenge. In many places, it's what's supporting the economy and supporting the conservation of our heritage. We have to be realistic sometimes that the money for conservation comes from tourism, but it's very dangerous when it takes over totally. And there are lots of problems when uh, heritage places, the, the use patterns change and they're no longer uh, being used in the way that they used to be, uh, positive and negative, but we need to understand what's working and not working. And here we return to the very uh, intelligent question earlier. It's obvious that some human activities are incredibly negative and there's nothing to be said, except this is a massive threat. And unfortunately, I don't think the heritage sector is quite ready. Um, we don't have all the answers. Climate change, as Eugene has already mentioned, is an issue that's increasingly becoming a problem in many different ways that were unexpected. Lots of countries that initially weren't looking at these issues because it seemed uh, to not directly affect them. We've now discovered many of the impacts uh, are affecting even sites. Um, for example, it's not just as obvious as, a, as an island which has got rising sea levels. We're now finding things like acid rain is causing the conservation deterioration of many built heritage properties in locations far away from the sea. The change in conditions of um, pollution added with unexpected weather is causing massive deterioration of heritage. Uh, and sudden ecological and geological events, obviously this is directly related to the disaster risk, things that we can see coming but can't manage very well. And again, um, things about invasive species which may not seem immediately obvious to culture, but within a cultural landscape or an agricultural uh, world heritage property are a massive factor actually. And we come back to management, which is the big theme of the day. Uh, the, the periodic reporting continues to show that management is a really big issue for making things better or worse. And finally, you might decide there are other factors that um, are an issue for the property. The world is changing dramatically. Things that we wouldn't predict uh, many years ago are, are becoming issues that we have to deal with in many of our properties. So you might find that, that um, both at work and in the case study exercise, there are factors which are not on this World Heritage list, and I would encourage you to think about them. Uh, see what really are the, the, the bigger questions that might need to be explored in impact assessment. So let me, um, let me finish sharing there. We're going to send you straight away quite quickly now to your breakout rooms. This list of factors, again, is you can find it you can find both this PowerPoint presentation in the shared folder of presentations. It's already there if you want to refer to it. Or in the group work folder, there is just the single list of the factors. It would be great if you could just consider what are the three, four, five biggest issues that are facing the birthplace of Jesus property. And in particular, which of them make it perhaps vulnerable 
to other developments, if things are happening and things are changing, which of these are really the key issues that would need to be also considered within impact assessment? Because it's not that the impact assessment has an obligation to consider all of these factors, but if they're making the property vulnerable in some way, weakening its management, either in the present or the future, we need to be analysing that as part of the assessment. So I don't need to say any more. We just, I think, probably only need five, ten minutes to just really look at the list in your groups and decide those key factors, please. So if we have, Naaman, if you're if you're ready for our sending everyone to, to their rooms, please. Oh, we're uh, waiting uh, our uh, IT specialist to come in order to divide each one into uh, his or her room. So just be patient with us for like seconds. Then perhaps I will, if yeah. those of you who who are looking at your the shared folder, I'll try to share it here in the chat as well. You could begin to look at that list so that as soon as you get to your groups, you already have your, your favorite three factors and then you can debate in the group which ones uh, everybody agrees on. Uh, excuse me, Sarah, where is the file? It's within the exercise, group yes. work exercises. Yes, within the group work, there should be um, a, a PDF that's called factors list. There is not a template to complete. It's just the list of factors. I've just put it also in the chat just so that you can look at them very easily and decide which ones are most relevant. Because we have exercise two and three. I'm trying to look for the... Oh, let me just check. I did... Now, yeah, yeah, the PDF. Have it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay. Can I ask a question before they separate us? Like you are talking about, really it's very interesting this topic because most of these factors that are threatening our sites are not including, especially when we are talking about pollution, climate change and noise. Sometimes this issue, I see it's not of that importance when we are talking about cultural heritage locally that much. And the issue, the most important maybe a natural uh, threat to our uh, heritage sites uh, is the earthquake because we are in uh, a very critical situation and especially in Jericho, Nablus, Jerusalem and Hebron. And I would like to ask if the site already was nominated and selected as a world heritage site and already it is in a threatened situation. Like it's like maybe will uh, any earthquake can happen and then the site, we will lose the site. So do you think this assessment should be done even uh, when we are preparing for the nomination to serve? Because we know that the site is under threat of the earthquake, for example. And not to wait, I mean, later for any development, because we know the threat is, exists even before. And I remember, like I've read, like 100 years ago, almost, like in 1927, the earthquake that took place, most like, 80% of the damage we have now in the old city of Nablus is because of that earthquake. M more than it, like 20%, 30% of the damage, sorry. So I believe already the old city of Nablus like is threatened since 100 years ago. And it is on the tentative list. And I believe if we're going to prepare a nomination file for a World Heritage Site, do you think this should be assessed like as a threat or a factor that uh, impact the site while preparing for the fire? This is one question. Mm -hmm. And the other question is that when we are uh, doing these factors like that are threatening the site, do you think we have to go through all the list or we can really think about something else? And what, what are the most threatening factors that we should really uh, take into consideration like a priority? Uh, Thank you. A lot of questions. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, um, certainly disaster risk is a major issue, but I think our colleagues at UNESCO know this very well because I understand they would also like to organise um, other training for, for disaster risk, not just this one on impact assessment. So hopefully in the future, it's something you can perhaps go into more detail. Um, with regards to nomination, obviously, uh, no one can manage uh, natural disasters. It's not possible. And I think you would you would remove almost every property from the list if, if that was the case. 
But I think the nomination file, what is expected is that there's um, the management system is aware of this and that there is a disaster risk management plan. So that there's um, you're trying to mitigate the problems in advance and there is an action plan should something occur. So I think it's it's the nomination file is looking for proactive management of these issues. That's the quick answer. Um, with regard to the factors, if you look at if you just look at first of all at the these 13 points, I think you'll decide quite quickly which ones are relevant or not. I, I personally don't want to give you priorities. You know better than I do the situation in Palestine. Um, but the list, the list generally works. I mean, it was created and it's been updated for, for the periodic reporting. So it's it does usually cover most things people have, but obviously if there are specific issues arising in, in your case, please list them. It's an invitation to think more broadly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Zahra. Are uh, we going now to the breakout rooms? Okay. Uh, for how long, uh, Sarah? 10 minutes or 20? No, 10 minutes, I think, is more than enough okay. to decide the, the most important factors. And then I'll open the rooms now. Muted
Hello? Yes, ما بنلحق ننزل الفايل للفاكتورز بي دي اف لحظه هون
الوقت ثمان ثواني ورح ترجعوا أقل رح ترجعوا للاجتماع Uh, okay, we're going now to uh, Ahmed Hifnawi, the, the developer of Bethlehem Development Fund. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Ahmed. Uh, just a second. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Ahmed Hifnawi, I'm working for uh, Bethlehem Development Foundation. Um, I'm uh, the development coordinator of uh, this foundation's uh, project. Uh, also, I'm working for uh, CCC, Consolidated Contractor Company. It's an, uh, one of the leading construction companies uh, in the Middle East and uh, worldwide. Uh, I was seconded to the Bethlehem Development Initiative, which was launched by the founders of uh, CCC. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank UNESCO Ramallah and uh, all the team for the hard work uh, and for inviting us to uh, present some of the projects uh, uh, we developed, we, some others we already executed and uh, others still uh, under planning process. Uh, I also would like to introduce uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Ms. Basma Husseini from uh, Athens office. Um, uh, she will um, go to uh, in the details of the two case studies projects. Uh, and our presentation, uh, as you'll see, will be um, divided in two parts uh, as a developer in the area. Uh, the first part is um, uh, about uh, the work of CCC and uh, Bethlehem uh, Development Foundation in Bethlehem region. And the second part um, will be presented by uh, Mrs. Basma Husseini specifically about uh, uh, two projects, case uh, studies. Uh, I'll share my screen now to start uh, our presentation. Um, uh, okay, as uh, I told you previously, um, uh, this is the main points we'll uh, be talking about um, for the like next 20 minutes. Hopefully, uh, we'll uh, manage to complete the presentation, noting the time limitations. <clears throat> we'll talk uh, about the uh, consulted contractors company, uh, 20 years presence in Bethlehem region, um, about the Bethlehem Development Initiative. Uh, the Bethlehem Development Foundation, which is the, um, uh, the implementing arm of uh, the Bethlehem Development Initiative, uh, and about um, the development of the Nativity Church area uh, we were involved in. Uh, and last, uh, we will present to you the two case studies projects we proposed uh, uh, for uh, the development of the area. Um, starting with the CC 20 years presence in Bethlehem, a consolidated contracts company started operation in the area um, 20 years ago, uh, immediately after Oslo agreement. Um, our first project was the establishment of the re rehabilitation of Solomon Pools and uh, uh, in partnership with uh, PIF, Palestinian Investment Fund. Uh, the construction of the um, convention palace in the area. Um, the area was leased to CCC and uh, PIF uh, by the Palestinian Awqaf for uh, uh, 25 years. Uh, we're still operating there and uh, preserving the Solomon pools and uh, the convention palace. Uh, in during um, Bethlehem uh, Millennium Celebration and uh, the Bethlehem uh, 2000s project, 
CCC had the construction management of, uh, of this, uh, this project. Uh, after that, and evaluating all the previous work, uh, CCC and uh, Bethlehem Alfen uh, have been in the region. We evaluated uh, the whole situation and uh, we believe that the Bethlehem area needs a, a comprehensive development plan. Um, so in 2011, uh, the Bethlehem Development Initiative was launched by the founders of uh, CCC. Uh, to do that, we hired uh, two urban planning uh, firms, Khatib and Alami and Arup from uh, Britain, uh, to develop a 20 years uh, development action plan for the Bethlehem area. Uh, in summary, about the initiative, in 2011, Mr. Said Khouri, the founder of CCC, visited Bethlehem. Second quarter of 2011, um, Khatib Alami and Arup were hired to develop the master plan. Um, we had two local stakeholders meetings. Uh, the, the draft plan was presented uh, to CCC in, in March uh, 2012. Um, the plan was approved and uh, uh, a non-profit organization uh, was established to start implementing this uh, development action plan, which is the Bethlehem Development Foundation we are working for uh, until today. Um, and uh, in September, I skipped to September 2013, uh, we secured the first fund to execute the solid waste management plan as the first project uh, of Bethlehem Development Foundation in the area. Um, this infograph presents the, the, the development plan was uh, uh, prepared by Khatib Alami and uh, Arab. Um, the plan links the main three cities of Bethlehem uh, governorate, Beit Shala, Beit Sahur, uh, Bethlehem and Beit Sahur. Uh, Bethlehem is the center of the region. Uh, the arcs uh, represent, or within the arcs you, you see in the screens, uh, are the most, um, most of the projects were identified uh, in the master plan. So our focus was always, from the beginning was uh, within these arcs. Uh, and were divided into development arcs, including the infrastructure project, the heritage arcs, uh, the access and movement arcs, and the uh, open spaces. Uh, the, proposed, uh, the proposed projects for the Nativity Church area um, um, were part of uh, 13 projects were identified during the development uh, uh, plan. Uh, these uh, three, 13 projects were divided into uh, two categories, the quick win uh, projects and the long-term projects based on the needs of the stakeholders and the city from our point of view. Uh, as Nativity Church is the spiritual center of uh, Bethlehem Governorate, uh, our focus uh, our focus was uh, in this area from the beginning. And uh, for this purpose, we proposed we started working immediately uh, since 2011 in uh, four projects. Uh, the first one was uh, the Nativity Church restoration. The second one, uh, the Manger Square rehabilitation. Uh, the third one was Manger Square Shallow Tunnel and last the uh, Armenian car park and commercial center next to the Nativity Church. Um, as for the Nativity Church restoration project, CCC uh, had a leading role in uh, launching this project and um, funded the needs assessment study prepared by Arup. Um, CCC also was the, um, one of the first to donate uh, for starting the, um, the restoration works, uh, starting from the roof. 
Uh, and since 2013 until today, PDF uh, could manage to uh, secure 15% of the needed funded needed funds for the restoration works. Um, the second project, as I told you previously, was the Manger Square Rehabilitation Project. Um, uh, as Manger Square is the iconic center of Bethlehem, uh, we notified that uh, the square used to be an uh, on-street parking uh, in order to solve uh, and uh, deal with this issue. Um, we, pro we, we proposed uh, um, a beautification plan and uh, rehabilitation uh, project for the square and the surrounding. The project included um, uh, rehabilitation, of, uh, rehabilitation of the um, uh, municipal buildings, the two buildings, creating uh, green roofs. Uh, adding um, lighting system to the area and to the Nativity Church, and uh, uh, using for the first time the, the solar panels and the solar energy technology uh, to light the, the street, uh, besides the uh, cleaning and restoration of the tiles of the square itself, making it more comfortable for visitors and um, uh, residents to use all day around. Uh, the project um, costed almost $2 million and um, took place and uh, was completed in uh, December 2014. Uh, uh, now I'll give the floor to my colleague Basma Hosseini to present for you uh, the, Mar the Manchester Square uh, uh, Commercial and Real Estate Development Project and the panel as well. Basma, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ahmed, thank you. And I just wanted to let you know that I also pasted uh, a link to a video, a very short video on the rehabilitation of Manger Square, if anybody's interested to watch that. Uh, it will give you a brief on uh, exactly, and you know, it will show you the details and how everything was rehabilitated. So I pasted the link in the chat if anyone's interested. Um, Ahmed, I, I can't share my screen. I think you have to. No, no, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop sharing, and you share from your side. Mm -hmm. Can everyone see my screen now? Ahmed, can can you see the yes, screen? Yes, okay. Yes. Sorry, let me just skip. Okay. So we can see um, that the site is located uh, southeastern corner of uh, Manger Square. Uh, as you can see, it's highlighted in red. So it's very close to Manger Square and the Church of the Nativity. Um, the site is, uh, the land is owned by the Armenian uh, Patriarch. And um, as you can see, it has a 10 meter drop. So it's a very steep site. Um, it's in very close proximity to the Peace Center, the Church of Nativity um, and uh, Mandar Square. So it's a very, you know, it's a very important location. Um, the lot is around uh, 3,200 square meters, and it's currently used as a parking lot with a capacity of 100 cars. Um, I'm going to take you through um, the initial design and show you how we moved on from that and uh, changed the design. So when we asked for a concept, we hired Khatib and Alami from Le Lebanon to come up with a concept. And this was the first design that they showed us, which was basically a block concept, as you can see here, um, which had retail on the sides and um, an atrium in the middle with automated parking underneath. Um, and you can see it's a very large construction. So when we saw this design, we asked them to submit something uh, that's more, um, uh, let's say, staggered and um, that takes into account the local fabric and the surroundings. So the highlighted area in green was the optimal solution that they presented to us. And we asked them to rethink their design and present something that 
takes to the surroundings into account. So what we did here is we were asked them to come up with something that mimics uh, the old souks of Beit Lahem and the alleyways. And we also wanted a direct visual access to Manjur Square. Um, so these are some pictures that show you, um, you know, some, you know, we wanted something that uh, was more sensitive towards the local fabric and the surrounding neighborhood. Um, so this is a 3D image of um, uh, the develop, the second developed design, which you can see is more terraced and which uh, mimics the old souk and um, uh, the alleyways of uh, Bethlehem. So this is just a visual image to show you how it blends into the surrounding fabric. Um, the the Manjur Square village, um, along with other major interventions, endeavors to streamline the traffic in the square and the surrounding streets. So there's a lot of traffic currently, and we wanted to take away from that. So it provides ample automated parking areas uh, for 300 cars, uh, drop-off zones, a commercial center with uh, stores, cafes, terraces, uh, planted shaded areas and uh, a lot of community centers uh, with around 16, uh, 500 meter squares of built up area. The current proposed designs calls for a 10 floor multi-level complex divided into two sections. The total built up area, uh, we already mentioned that is around 16,500 square meters. And it has uh, retail on seven levels uh, from commercial entertainment, public spaces and traditional parking. And the bottom three floors will accommodate automated parking facility to provide space for 300 cars. Um, the retail space includes souvenir and tourist shops, uh, supermarket, cafes, restaurants, and public leisure spaces. And uh, the design philosophy revolves around having easy flow spaces that naturally invite users from the surrounding sidewalks and from Manjur Square into the, into the commercial center. Um, and the main idea is to allow pedestrian movement to flow into the heart of the project. Um, as we said, to mimic the souks and alleyways and have open air cafes and restaurants with a nice visual access onto Manjur Square. So here's a section that shows the, the lower parking areas underground B4, B5 and B6, which will consist of a fully automated parking system. And um, the the built up area for these levels is 4,898 square meters. And the system provides an engineered mechanized automated multi-level parking solution that exploits the full economic value and potential of the land. Um, as, uh, okay, so yeah. So if we go through, I'm just going to flip through the plants quickly, just so you can see how the design um, is staggered and uh, pays attention to the surroundings. Um, so we have a lot of uh, empty space and a lot of staggered shops. And then there's a void in the middle as well that uh, invites people into the project. And here we have a lot of terraces. So we have a lot of uh, semi-public private spaces for people uh, to be able to view uh, Manjur Square and uh, the Church of Nativity. And I'll just quickly go through these here. We have a lot of restaurants and terraced uh, shops and cafes and the cinema as well. And uh, then this is the entrance to the automated parking, uh, which has um, four uh, elevators and it automatically stores the cars into B1, B, uh, into the basement areas and the parking areas. So, the benefit of the uh, multi-purpose parking is that ad uh, additional parking spaces will mitigate the area congestion, parking shortages, and traffic flow problems. The parking will offer safe and secure spaces for individual visitors, especially during Christmas and Easter, and especially that we have a huge problem with parking in the area. Um, the system can use 66% less surface area compared to a conventional garage. So um, it really saves a lot of space. Uh, it will improve the quality of life uh, through the public spaces, and it will offer safe, pedestrianized, car-free environment with an increase in natural air quality. 
And this is a final image of the project. Um, and now I'll move on to another project, which is a preliminary proposal for the Manger Square shallow passageway. Uh, we actually have two proposals, one for a deep tunnel and one for a shallow passageway. But uh, the shallow passageway um, in the purpose of this presentation is more relevant. So I will only be focusing on the shallow passageway uh, for the purposes of this presentation. And if you're interested in having more information, then please contact us and we can show you the study for uh, which shows you all the details and all the plans that were designed. So. Uh, the shallow passageway was proposed, uh, which is around 168 meters, uh, to allow an easier traffic flow and a more convenient access to the area by locals, pilgrims, and tourists. Um, it underlies the road segment between the Peace Center and the Armenian Patria car parking lot at Al Ain Street. The underpass underlies the road segment between the Peace Center and the Manger Square, and the selected route embraces many challenging elements, such as available space constraints, existing buildings, construction methods, uh, and the project was found feasible, provided that the local constraints and the long-term impacts will adequately mitigate it. Part of Manger Street was lowered at the intersection with the passageway. Two covered sections provided along the passageway, one between the Nativity Church and the Manger Square, and the other at uh, Ata Street uh, Crossing. Uh, and there is one proposed pedestrian bridge, uh, which is shown in the map. So if we look at the legend, we see that um, the, Manger, uh, the Manger Street pedestrian bridge is proposed in the pink um, uh, at the top part of the map. And then you have two red highlighted uh, proposed underpasses. The blue shows you the proposed retaining walls. And this is uh, the proposed cross section. So we see the shallow passageway typical section uh, at Manger Square versus uh, the underpass typical section at the Nativity Church, which is uh, much lower and under the ground. So considering the site conditions and traffic constraints, the traditional cut and cover construction method might not be the optimal solution in this case. So here the Khattiban uh, Alami favored the top-down construction method, which has more advantages, and it allows minimal interference with the traffic flow. Uh, the method consists of construction, uh, constructing a diaphragm wall to support the excavation sites and to cover it and continue the excavation works inside with no need to interrupt the traffic further. And here we have uh, the horizontal alignment, which shows you the minimum inner radius used in preparation of conceptual design, which was 30 meters, and the maximum allowable speed limit uh, is 30 km kilometers per hour. Whereas with the vertical alignment, the maximum recommended slope is 6%. And the minimum, uh, and the, we also have to avoid having vertical and horizontal curves at the uh, same location to avoid site distance conflicts. And it maintains a two meter cover as a minimum on grade finished level and tunnel roof for future construction utilities. And the proposed construction method um, is the top-down construction method, the brace cut method, and it was due. It was chosen due to significant location of the site, its proximity to world heritage and religiously significant buildings, the density of the surroundings, as well as it being the main target area for pedestrians and tourists. With this method, the tunnel walls are construction first using the second pile walls. In this method, the support of excavation is the final structural tunnel walls. Next, the roof is constructed and tied into the support of excavation walls. So um, we actually have a study, a complete study for both tunnels. So if anyone's interested, then please don't hesitate to contact us and we can give you um, the final proposal, which has more details uh, regarding the tunnel. Um. So I don't know if anyone has any more questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Basma. Thank you, uh, thank Ahmed, you. for your presentation. Uh, so we will uh, open the floor for discussions, questions, uh, if you have any. Thank you. Hi, Basma. Thank you so much, you and Ahmed, for the presentation. Um, do you have any section that includes the, the village with the surrounding? Because uh, I saw the building that is designed against the contour. 
against the topography because we started the entrance from the very near the nativity and do have three floors below. One second, I'm just, yeah, this is a picture. Not clear enough, but I mean, uh, for the foundations and for the three, three floors below the street level, did you consider the excavation and the foundation and digging below and you are close to a very sensitive site? This is the first yes, question. Yes, it was considered. With, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, go, okay. go ahead. <laughs> no, no, this was uh, taken into consideration, which is why they decided to go three floors underground and not more because initially they wanted to go even six floors underground. Um, uh, but uh, if you look at the site contour, it, it's, there's a 10 meter slope. Uh, so it, they took the, you know, they took into consideration the slope of the site when designing um, the parking level. So they don't actually have a large cut and fill, um, you know, uh, let's say area. But let me go into the section. Maybe that would be more useful. If you have another photo from the other side, because this is only showing uh, look, us. It's a preliminary end. design, so it, it wasn't taken further. Ah. I mean, I just have an image because it was a very preliminary design, but we didn't go along with it. Um, I mean, it wasn't uh, taken further, let's say, the design. So this is an image, okay. a 3D rendering. Um, yeah, it's only from the entrance. Uh, yeah. I have another image which uh, shows the interior and I have the section. Um, so it's yes, it does cut three floors underground, but these floors are, you know, they're high. It's a cut it's field. Less. It's a yes. cut field, no? Well, the, there is a 10 meter slope. So oh. yes, it does cut where the parking is, but you have to take into consideration that the parking, the height of the floor is much less. So it's around 2.8 uh, meters. For but the, the foundation parking. will be lower the three floors under the ground, right? Yes, yes. A lot of excavations and you don't know what wow. is beneath because it's very historical religious area. So I don't know if you studied the site uh, like historical uh, no, records. Um, yeah. This is the other. This where, this is where the project stopped because we presented this uh, conceptual design and we had uh, a meeting with the Ministry of um, Tourism to present this um, conceptual design and for uh, as a first step we need to um, excavate um, in three different locations uh, and if any antiquities were founded the, the project immediately will be stopped. This is uh, this is why the, the owner of, of the land um, asked us to stop the project because, of course, if uh, if uh, if there is any uh, antiquities there, uh, the, the whole lot will be um, um, belong to the Ministry of Tourism and managed by them. So they, they didn't want to lose what they already have now, like the eight hundred. Uh, uh, spaces for parking. Thank you, Ahmed. I see Dr. Ahmed Urju is raising his hand. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Muhammad, and thank you, Ahmed and Sumaya, for uh, the two presentations. And um, thank you for for all. Actually, I just want uh, to basically clarify, you know, the the issue here, especially. Uh, when Zahra asked uh, about the levels and the excavations, uh, I don't know why uh, the Armenian actually church have, uh, has such uh, uh, you know concern about uh, the, uh, the archaeology. But anyhow, I can I can say uh, speaking uh, in archaeological terms, yes, uh, the archaeological remains in this. Please, we don't know what we have there, but uh, we all of us sure that it's a very important archaeological site, and uh, for sure we will uh, find uh, important archaeological uh, remains in this in this place. Uh, therefore, uh, such concerns, uh, you know, were part of uh, the concerns of uh, the ECOMOS. Admi uh, advisory mission uh, to, to Bethlehem. So uh, I just want really to clarify this, the, this issue. So when we speak about Bethlehem, about this place, 
uh, for sure we have archaeological remains, but uh, uh, it's not because if we have archaeological uh, remains that the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquity is going uh, to confiscate the land or take the land. No, this is uh, this is not not actually it's not true. Um, not with uh, with this issue. So uh, the problem here uh, actually uh, the impact of this project project. Uh, on the Nativity Church and on uh, uh, on the uh, Armenian uh, convent it, uh, itself. So this is the, this is the, the issue. Actually, it's not regarding the archaeological sites whether uh, we have or not. I'm just uh, uh, to clarify this this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Zahra again, uh, raising your hand, please. The floor yeah, is yours. Because yeah, because I didn't finish my question. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Ahmed, for the clarifications. Uh, despite the archaeological excavations and finding and whatever, I believe the concept didn't take the social economy into consideration of the old city of Bethlehem. And I relate to what uh, Sarah had presented on uh, the impact, uh, Sarah and Eugene, uh, on the impact of any project in a socio-economic and environmental. And as well, this project will be I believe not for the local community, it will be direct target for the tourism and will impact the social economy of the old city uh, of, uh, the, for the local community in Bethlehem. And as well, the design is, uh, is only was tested uh, visual wise, it, didn't, it wasn't tested like an urban design project that we are making better places for the local people. And I believe it is a small step, if not really was men uh, meant like a gentrification project and will make the prices in Bethlehem higher. And I was just related to what was presented and what you are presenting now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Zahra. Um, I see also Tamara Hodeli is raising her hand. Uh, after Tamara, I don't know Ahmed or Basma would like to comment on anything, but uh, let's listen. Yeah, sure, to... sure. Yeah. We'll answer all. Um... Okay, okay. Tamara, please. Uh, yes, I I've just uh, I noticed that um, a complete set of buildings uh, have disappeared in order to build this uh, village. Uh, buildings just across the street from the Nativity Church that belong to the Armenian convent uh, and now host uh, souvenir uh, shops uh, for so many years. And uh, they are kind of, uh, of part of the, the Church of the Nativity because they belong to the Armenian uh, convent and uh, they are in the center of the, of the buffer zone. So I just wanted uh, to let everyone else know about this. Thank you, Tamara, for this question. Uh, we'll probably take uh, Dr. Ahmed and then we'll be back to you, Ahmed and Basma. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Muhammad, again. Uh, actually, uh, I just want to raise the issue, which is uh, Tamara, yes, uh, she raised uh, one issue uh, regarding, you know, the traditional buildings uh, here, you know. Uh, to, to be honest, if we take, you know, the project as uh, as all, all uh, the your concerns, all what Zahra and Tamara said were taken into consideration, in addition, in addition, uh, uh, you know, to the traffic, because uh, uh, as Sumaya and Ahmad mentioned, we, we will have a bucking lot here, uh, which uh, uh, let's say uh, contradict with the main uh, idea about uh, our world heritage site in this, in this place, because we, we think to have, you know, this area as a pedestrian. Uh, to, to, to be honest, okay. So, hi, so uh, the, here we have conflict uh, actually between uh, what we should have, you know, for Bethlehem, and then uh, when we when we uh, uh, think about uh, having, you know, such a huge building, such a huge, let's, let's say, uh, commercial center, it will affect and conflict with the main idea. This is one thing. The other thing as well, which is we, 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 we should think about, uh, about, you know, uh, we are going to build, you know, uh, a commercial center in this area. What about, you know, the, the, the shops in the uh, uh, Star Street and, you know, other 
uh, streets, you know, in, in this area. So we are going to kill actually uh, that commercial uh, uh, shops and commercial economic uh, or okay, the economic status uh, of uh, of that uh, or lo of local people. Uh, so you know, I I'm not going to speak. Uh, um, a lot of things about a lot of things in this in this issue, but uh, I'm giving giving you uh, some hints about about this issue and uh, its uh, its effect, you know, on the world heritage site and uh, on the local community. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I'm sorry, Mohammed. Yes, uh, I see uh, Samia, uh, but we'll take the question of Samia after Ahmed and uh, and uh, um, Basma comment, because we don't want to have a long list of questions and then it will be difficult to uh, deal with. Um, okay, uh, first of all, like we would clarify that we were invited to, to, to participate in this workshop and as a developer, so uh, uh, discard that our our background, uh, mine and Vesma's is uh, urban planning and uh, urban development. Now we are talking about uh, like most uh, other developers. So first of all, uh, regarding the, the the shops, the already the existing um, shop souvenir shops, uh, uh, we would like to to clarify that this project is. Um, uh, a partnership between uh, CCC, potential local investors, and the Armenian Patriarchy. So they are part of, they were part of this project. Uh, the, the existing souvenir, we investigated that, we, we, we took them into consideration, and we, we found that they are not considered as historical buildings. The owners the, of these shops will have a place in the commercial center and they will be offered uh, same, <clears throat> same spaces, same shops as the one they have now for free. Uh, secondly, regarding the, um, the, the whole concept of the project and the, 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 the traffic management plan in the area um, that uh, Dr. Ahmed Rajouk read. Um, Doctor, um, Doctor Ahmed, you remember that, like until 2014, 2013, maybe, uh, the, the, the Manger Square used to be a parking lot, accommodating almost like um, 70 to, to 80 cars every day, all day, and this is, was an, like um, uh, an ugly image of um, Manger Square in front of the Nativity Chair. Uh, the existing parking lot now accommodate 100. Uh, uh, parking spaces. This project will accommodate underground without affecting uh, the view of the Nativity Church, the Manja Square, and the Armenian uh, lot will accommodate nearly 300 cars underground. So this is this will 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 solve the issue of parking spaces around the Nativity Church. Uh, secondly, part of the uh, of the Manger Square beautification project, we uh, like for the first time. Uh, one of the items we we built there is the automated bollards uh, that the municipality can control when to open the Manger Square to be used as a parking and when to close it. And um, like many of you, you may have noted that. There is uh, the Manchester Square is not used as a parking space as it was before, like two or three, four years ago. Uh, so this concept is a combination of commercial, because we are investors, we are developers, and as well to uh, solve the parking places in the area to accommodate, to maximize it, to, to actually to double it underground. Um, this from my side, I don't know, Basma, if you want to regard. I just want to also point to the fact that this was designed um, in 2014. Uh, back then, we had the issue of lack of parking um, and trying to, I mean, yes, the idea of pedestrianization is something that we have tried several times to, let's say, uh, 
uh, recommend. But uh, what was always requested was, okay, where do we park the cars? So this came as a solution to emptying uh, Manger Square from the, par from the car park. Um, instead of turning Manger Square into a car park, the idea is, was to have a car park in close proximity where the tourists could walk direct into Manger Square and so that the area would be more pedestrian friendly. Um, so I, I don't know if things have changed in the last six years and if uh, now there's a new plan to pedestrianize the whole area, but this we just have to take into account that this was designed before those plans came into account. Um, and also it was designed for tourists in mind. I mean, um, th th I wouldn't say that this multi uh, complex is designed for the locals. No, I would say this was designed for tourists in mind. Uh, and the idea was to um, have more local uh, shops open up instead of, it, the idea is not to take away from Star Street, but rather to enhance and have more uh, or encourage local, um, let's say, uh, businesses to open up like to um, mimic Star Street and have, you know, create more of a, a route within Star Street and create more uh, shops, which would be um, local and uh, tourist friendly at the same time. So, uh, thank yeah. you, Basma and uh, Ahmed. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, very, uh, very good. Uh, we have another question from Samia and then from Hannah. Please, Samia. Hello to everyone. Well, it's not a question, it's kind of a comment. Uh, when I saw this project uh, now, I feel like I am very angry to seeing such a project. It's kind of out of context. It doesn't live Bethlehem. I mean, it's a, a firm that is out of Bethlehem from Greece, or I don't know who made that design. They didn't live as we live here in Bethlehem, and we know how how is Bethlehem? How is the fabric of Bethlehem? Uh, the first uh, thing that in the around 2000, when they were developing the area of the Manger Square and the Nativity and all the surroundings, so there was the project of the bus station. That uh, uh, that as uh, as I know, it cancelled the. Uh, the let's say the the life that is going to be uh, created for the locals uh, going through uh, the um, the trail the uh, the mangers the trail to the nativity. So the idea was to have uh, the tourists going through uh, this the this this street the Star Street, go along the shops, live with the peoples, and go through all the uh, to feel Bethlehem and go to the church, the Nativity Church. Now, uh, when they uh, um, set up the uh, bus station, so they cancelled all this, and the Star Street uh, died. Uh, effectively, it died. It didn't work out. Again, now, in these couple of years, we are trying to, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, give life back to Star Street and make, again, the tourists walk through this, uh, this, uh, this street and going to the church. Now, such a project, I think it has many problems. One of them is the traffic. I don't know how are they going to get to this, uh, to this, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, commercial center because the the street going to it is a very tight street, and I don't know maybe the shallow street or the underground tunnel is going to solve this problem. The other thing is that, as uh, Dr. Zahra said, I mean Bethlehem is built over layers and layers of old old history and so on. So I don't think digging and excavating uh, below this area, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, there are layers of buildings below this area. Uh, second thing, I mean, um, uh, the, um, the uh, design that I'm seeing, um, it's very uh, modern design and uh, it, we didn't see any, um, any, uh, let's say, facade uh, as uh, we can see it from below to see how it affects uh, uh, the landscape as well as the view of the nativity. This is not clear in their, uh, in their presentation. Um, in, in all contexts, I, th I think this is a threat. This is one of the threats that we were discussing. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Samia. Uh, we're actually running out of time, so we'll be taking uh, Hannah now and then uh, see if uh, Basma and uh, Ahmed would like to uh, to respond or comment of what is uh, mentioned. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have a uh, question about the tunnel project. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't we banned to construct or obtain uh, a tunnel or a, nor a bridge by Oslo agreement? Uh, thank you, uh, Hannah. So, Basma or Ahmed would like to respond or yes. to, to have any comment? Sure. sure. In response to Hannah's questions, yes, you are right. This is what we found during the developing the concept of uh, of a tunnel. Unfortunately, in uh, in 1994, in uh, Oslo II, the Oslo II agreement. Uh, known as Tava Agreement, um, it was signed that uh, the Palestinians or the Palestinian Authority is not allowed to to, to construct any tunnel, any tunnel even in Area A. The only of what we know, the only exception was uh, uh, a tunnel in uh, leading to the commercial center in the downtown of uh, Nablus City. And uh, the Israeli side approved it uh, under one condition to leave it open from the top. So it's um, 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 a shallow passageway, not a tunnel. Uh, but yeah, you are true. We are not allowed to construct any tunnel, even in Area A, which is supposedly in, uh, under full control of the Palestinian Authority. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, obviously, this is an interesting uh, case that uh, will take uh, lots of uh, time to discuss uh, all its dimensions. And it will be the subject of our uh, um, uh, exercises and sessions in the coming or uh, remaining days of, the, of this uh, training. Um, I would like to thank you all for uh, contributing and participating in this discussion. Uh, I would like just before, because we are approaching uh, the end, uh, if uh, Sara and Ascanio has uh, any kind of feedback on this or uh, anything that you need our participants to take into account uh, before we just leave and prepare for tomorrow's session. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, very quickly, I'd, I'd very much like to, to thank you both for this presentation because without um, a project to discuss, our course wouldn't have any sense at all. So to have these examples is really important. Um, tomorrow we're going to be looking at impacts. We spent a lot of time so far thinking about the heritage and the values and tomorrow we're really going to start to look at what that means. And um, from my point of view, I think th this discussion shows it's a really great case study. I think you're going in your groups have a lot of discussion um, and we just need to remember that this is an opportunity we can critique a project, uh, forgive me, uh, English play on words, without criticising. So we can find um, ways of suggesting positive uh, solutions or, or opportunities to explore without always um, uh, criticising the hard work that's gone on. I think impact assessment has to be a very positive process. Discussion is not always easy. This returns to our favourite theme of uh, involving stakeholders and and how do we always have these conversations and they're not always easy conversations but it is when we uh, are listening to many diverse points of view that we can usually find better solutions together so I think that is your big challenge tomorrow is to explore that uh, and it's it's not easy but if, if you get it right it's the magic it's when we find the solutions uh, to how we want our heritage places to be in the future so I hope you, when you, we come back tomorrow, you're all ready to, to find a positive future for Bethlehem. I mean, I just want to point out that initially, if you saw the first design, this is why I showed you the first design, which was a block, which is actually what all developers always you know, suggest initially. And we had to fight them 
to make it, you know, more, let's say, respectful of the surrounding and tell them, okay, we want something to, you know, mimic the souk of Bethlehem. So I just want to say that keep it in mind that we did have this fight with the designers and uh, the firm is Khatib and Alami. So they do have a local office in Palestine. It's not in Athens. It's Khatib and Alami. Uh, they do have a local office in Palestine. And, you know, we did go through this discussion with them in order to change it and make it more sensitive to the surrounding. So, yes, I do understand where everyone's coming from. I do agree. But, you know, um, when you, you know, developers just think differently. So it's, you know, the issue of how do you change that uh, frame of mind or how they think, you know, they, they think money, they don't think how, okay, let's think of the local community. So it's always a struggle of how do you design to please the developer, but at the same time to please the local community. So we tried to balance that, but clearly <laughs> it wasn't very successful, uh, but anyway. So just, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Basma, for this intervention. Yes, yeah, uh, sorry, Mohamed. Just, yeah, I just uh, want to add uh, ju just a uh, little thing. Uh, just to be sure that this material is available for all the participants uh, because it's so interesting. And so they, they will need it to, to make the exercise on impacts. Yeah. We'll make sure to have it. Uh, uh, our colleagues from the Bethlehem Development Foundation uh, generously uh, provided their time. I'm, time. I'm sure they will give us the materials as well. Uh, one last uh, comment uh, from uh, Dr. Ahmed Rujub, and then we'll be closing this session for today. Please, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Muhammad. <laughs> Actually, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, all of you and Ahmed and Asma. And we are not offending your project. Uh, this, uh, these two, uh, two cases are very important for us, and I just want uh, to remind uh, all our uh, uh, our uh, ourselves and all participants. I mean here that the two uh, projects projects were cancelled actually. Okay, so we are not offending or criticizing, you know, the the projects now, but we are taking the two projects, you know, uh, uh, for our training. So thank you very much, actually, Basma and Ahmad for uh, for presenting the, these two projects. Just to remind, uh, you know, the other participants who don't know that the, the, these two projects were cancelled. Okay, so they are not going to uh, to be implemented, you know, in the, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for all. Thank you all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time, for your um, participation effort. Uh, uh, it's uh, again an exciting day uh, and we wish to see you all tomorrow. Please, please have a look at the materials available on the shared uh, folder. Uh, have, a, have your time to look at them uh, to help us in the practical exercises and uh, be efficient in the groups. There are only three days remaining. Please um, just make use of uh, having our experts available with us. Thank you very much. You. Yes, and uh, tomorrow we'll be meeting at uh, 9.40. Uh, like uh, 20 to 10. Uh, let's see you all there. I hope uh, uh, in a good health. Uh, take care and have a nice uh, afternoon and evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.